Hi, my name is Zach Evans. I'm a veterans disability benefits attorney with Woods and Woods Attorneys in Evansville, Indiana. And today we're going to be talking about CNP examinations. I'm going to talk a little bit about what a compensation and pension examination is, what to expect, how to prepare for it, and uh, just generally how they're laid out. So first of all, a CNP examination, it's a compensation and pension examination, is set up by the VA regional office, uh, by the Veterans Benefits Administration. It's to assess your level of disability, or it is to assess whether a disability that you suffer from is related to your time in service. So a CNP examination will typically be performed by a medical professional. It's not always a doctor, but a lot of times they are performed by doctors. We also see uh, psychiatric nurses, clinical psychologists, uh, nursing practitioners, uh, people with credentials to administer some sort of uh, medical examination or make an analysis. So the difference between a CNP examiner and a private doctor sometimes is nothing. So sometimes we'll have private doctors that will contract with the VA in order to do some compensation and pension exams. Because as you can imagine, there's a huge backlog of claims. There's a huge backlog of, of exams that need to be completed. Um, so sometimes you'll go to a VA medical center and you'll receive a compensation and pension exam from a VA doctor in a VA facility. Sometimes your CMP exam will be performed by someone who is affiliated with the VA or has an agreement with the VA, but doesn't necessarily work for the VA directly. And the goal is to try to get this huge volume of exploratory examinations and, and assessments completed so that the regional office can issue you a decision on either service connection or about the severity of your disability. Typically at a CNP exam, you'll show up to the location of the exam and you'll have a battery of questions that an examiner will ask you about your condition. If it's a psychiatric examination, they'll ask you a little bit about your personal history. They'll ask you about your current symptoms. They'll ask you about uh, some of the challenges you face in your daily life, uh, how your either your PTSD, your major depressive disorder, your anxiety disorder, how those things impact you on a daily basis. And some of these exams are more thorough than others, uh, but typically what I see in my practice is uh, the issues that arise with uh, the thoroughness of exams tend to come up more often in mental health exams because it's really tough to cover the full breadth of someone's mental health disability in the course of a relatively short examination period. This depends on what you're going in to have assessed, uh, what's being evaluated. So obviously if it's a psychological assessment, uh, that's not likely to happen unless maybe you have other examinations pending that day because you might go see an orthopedist in the morning and then a couple of hours later you might talk to a clinical psychologist and some of those assessments can dovetail together really nicely. So let's say you have a back condition that you sustained in service as a result of a lumbar spine injury. And that is really impacting your activities of daily living, really impacting your, uh, your mood and your state of mind. Some of those things will overlap. For the orthopedic conditions themselves, there's absolutely a physical component. One of the things that needs to be tested on orthopedic examinations is your range of motion. And your range of motion is going to be impacted by things like flare-ups, um, what your current level of baseline severity is, what happens to you during a flare-up uh, flare event, what happens to you during periods of prolonged usage, such as during a typical workday, especially if you work on your feet. 
so some of these examinations will have a physical component where they're testing a certain body part and how it moves, whether it moves freely, whether you get some locking or some crepitus in the knee, something like that. Because of these varying types of CMP examinations, the length and the breadth of what's discussed can vary pretty significantly. Some of these examinations, unfortunately, uh, we've heard only last five, 10 minutes. And the evidence has unfortunately borne that out when we review the file. We'll get a questionnaire, typically in a standard form called a, a DBQ or a disability benefits questionnaire, where a psychologist will run through pretty quickly some boxes that ask a certain number of questions. And they'll, you know, like I covered earlier, they'll ask you about your employment history, they'll ask you about your diagnoses, and then they'll ask you about the current challenges uh, that you face with that condition. In my opinion, the mental health examinations should be longer. Uh, there should be much more time dedicated to ferreting out what has occurred to a veteran, how some of these behaviors or uh, coping skills, coping mechanisms took root in service and then progressed throughout a person's life. What you really need to be doing to prepare for your CMP exam is getting yourself in an open mental space to be able to talk about these things that you're dealing with, um, especially for mental health exams. It is very easy for survivors of military trauma to want to shut down in the middle of a psych exam to not want to discuss the full range of things that they've been dealing with. It's understandable. Sometimes that's a coping mechanism that is wrapped up in someone's diagnosis. You need to be thinking about um, exactly how your condition uh, impacts you and the things that you want to get out there. One of the things that I see pretty commonly in veteran psych files is a diminished or impaired ability to interact with loved ones, even people that they trust, like their family. And that is not something that you want to leave out of a CMP exam discussion, because if, you, if it's not discussed, if it's not brought up, if you are not being heard in this examination, then by omission, the VA will assume that you're functioning at a normal level in terms of your social and familial interactions. And oftentimes that simply isn't the case. Some of those things are difficult to recall. They're difficult to uh, bring up in the moment, um, just relying on your memory. Sometimes there's a lot of ground to cover in these examinations. Sometimes there are quite a few um, different areas of impairment related to a mental health condition or related to a back injury. And in order to make sure that you're covering all the bases and you're getting everything on the record that you can in that exam, having good notes and trying to think clearly before you go in about exactly what you need to get out there uh, can be really helpful. I really recommend that veterans keep journals of their conditions. I really think that if you journal in the morning, and in the evening, it doesn't have to be very long, just something that recounts during the day some challenges that you faced as a result of your service-connected knee pain, as a result of your PTSD. But a journal does a good job of keeping a record for you of exactly how this impacts you day to day. And that's the piece that's typically missing from CNP exams in the couple of weeks leading up to a scheduled uh, compensation and pension exam, if you can sort of do a daily rundown of what your day looks like, challenges that you're facing as a result of your service-connected conditions, you are, without them being there, you're essentially trying to walk the examiner through how this impacts you on a daily basis. Uh, so obviously a CMP exam can't take two weeks or Almost no one would get an exam done. 
But if you take a good written record in of, you know, I woke up in the morning and as soon as I tried to get out of, you know, as soon as I tried to get out of bed, my knee locked up and I noticed that my service connected ankle was extremely swollen. I had, I had fluid on my knee, something like that. Um, and then I went outside to get the mail and I got a few steps and my sciatica started acting up from my old back injury that I that I received whenever I was in the Marines. Uh, so these are all little pieces that can help paint a really good picture of how these conditions are impacting you. The goal is to make it real for the person reading it because it is easy for an examiner to just see you as a number or as an appointment and to check down a few discussion drivers or items of conversation. They'll check some boxes on what your functionality is and then that's it. They're on to the next examination. The plain language that you use, a lay person's language that you use with an examiner is okay. You don't have to know the ins and outs of clinical psychology. You don't have to know exactly, you know, the mechanics of orthopedic injuries. No one's expecting you to understand or be fluent in the, in those things. Certainly some of you probably are because you've been dealing with these things for so long. You've been in and out of doctor's offices. You've had multiple surgeries. Um, you've probably seen multiple mental health providers that have provided you some insight using these special words, these medical terms. And if you're comfortable using those words, certainly, but don't let that deter you from just saying what's on your mind and what's on your heart and what you're dealing with, uh, because this is your chance to get all of this. Like I said, on the record, this is your chance to tell your story. And if you feel like an examiner is rushing you, do everything you can to respectfully slow them down, ask them for an opportunity to be heard, make sure that they know that you feel the examination is not complete, that the discussion is not over, that you have more that you want to talk about. Remember, this examination, while it's being administered by a medical professional, is your examination. If you feel like something isn't being uh, explored enough, if you feel like you're being glossed over in the examination, you need to say something. You need to redirect the conversation. You need to say, you know, excuse me, sir or ma'am, but I feel like there are a few other things that I would like to discuss here that are important that relate to how this condition impacts my life. Take notes when you leave your exam about your feelings, uh, things that were discussed, things that were not discussed, um, and keep that. If someone provides me notes that they felt like uh, an examiner was rushing over bits of evidence, Let's say it's for a knee and they didn't even discuss the knee surgery that occurred just 10 months ago. I would like to jump on that. So you want to make sure you're keeping good notes on exactly what was discussed, what was not discussed. Many times you were rushed or hurried through uh, conversations. That's all useful because if they are ignoring your discussion items, if they're ignoring recent operations that you've had, if they're ignoring uh, some of the directives of your mental health treatment provider, and they're not encompassing that within the scope of this CNP examination, there's an argument to be made that we have an inadequate exam that cannot form the basis for a VA decision that can stand as, as valid. Do something fun when you're done. So schedule some time with your family, schedule some time with your friends, whether it's, uh, whether it's fishing with a buddy or taking your grandson to a racetrack or, you know, if it's running racks of eight ball at the VFW with your friends, do that. Take the time to do something that's enjoyable and can get your mind out of this cyclical type of thinking that can result from digging up these old bones, so to speak. Because what we want to make sure is that uh, the CNP examination is as accurate and as thorough as possible, but we don't want you to be impacted uh, long term.
these examinations are difficult enough. We want to make sure that you're trying to make plans to do something that can sort of relieve the stress and allow you to get back to as much functionality as you can because life is, life is about enjoying. Go online or give us a call. Again, my name is Zach Evans, a VA Disability Benefits Attorney with Woods & Woods in Evansville, Indiana, and we look forward to hearing from you.